Our sermon text for this morning comes from the book of John, chapter 17, verses 6 through 19. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me, I have given to them, and they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them in your name that you have given me. I guarded them them, and not one of them was lost except the one destined to be lost, so that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and I speak these things in the world so that they may have my joy made complete in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I am not asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world just as I do not belong. To the world. Sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so have I sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself so that they also may be sanctified in truth. The word of the Lord. A pastor, a priest, and a rabbi were having their usual morning cup of coffee at a local coffee shop. On this particular morning, they were discussing the point at which life begins. Life begins at conception, the priest said emphatically. No, countered the rabbi. I believe it begins at birth. Well, the pastor sat there and sipped her coffee as she pondered the question. And finally she said, you're both wrong. Life begins when the last child has left home and the dog dies. <laughs> we may chuckle at this pastor's take on when life begins, but how do we define life? This is a question that we all have heard or asked at one time or another. It may be asked in despair or in hope, out of cynicism or out of curiosity, with great hypocrisy or with great sincerity. However, however the question about the meaning of life is raised, it is a most basic and fundamental question. So it comes as no surprise that Jesus deals with this question. What is surprising 
is that Jesus' answer is not given in the context of an argument with the Jewish leaders or in a discussion with his disciples. It's not given in the teachings of the Sermon on the Mount or through the wisdom of a parable. Jesus deals with the meaning of life in the context of prayer. Many scholars have titled this prayer Jesus' High Priestly Prayer. Let's think about the setting for this passage. The disciples are gathered in the upper room. Having just finished the Passover meal, Jesus is thinking about his crucifixion, which will occur within the next 24 hours. He knows he is about to leave his disciples alone in the world, so he goes before God as the priest would to intercede for them and to pray for them. Listen again to part of Jesus' prayer for his disciples, this time as it is translated in the message by Eugene Peterson. Holy Father, guard the disciples as they pursue this life that you conferred as a gift through me, so they can be one heart and mind as we are one heart and mind. As long as I was with them, I guarded them in the pursuit of the life you gave through me. I even posted a night watch. Now I'm returning to you. I'm not asking that you take them out of the world, but that you guard them from the evil one. They are no more defined by the world than I am defined by the world. Make them holy, consecrated with the truth. Your word is consecrating truth. In the same way that you gave me a mission in the world, I give them a mission in the world. Jesus is saying that the meaning of life is found in a relationship with God and with him, God's son, Jesus Christ. That, my friends, is the long and short of it. Jesus prays, in the same way that you gave me a mission in the world, I give them a mission in the world. When Moses brought down the Ten Commandments from Mount Sinai, he gathered all the Israelites together and read the commandments before the people. Then he summed up the Ten Commandments in these words. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. So when Jesus was asked by an expert in the law, teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. It is fitting that on the evening before his crucifixion, Jesus prays that his disciples will come to know God in a personal way, the way that Jesus knows God. Jesus prayed, Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me so that they may be one as we are one. Jesus wants his disciples to have a relationship with the Father, just as he does. But Jesus doesn't stop there. He goes on to pray, they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself so that they also may be sanctified in truth. We may live in the world, but Jesus reminds us that we do not belong to the world. We belong to him. And our commission is to go into the world as the bearers of God's word, God's truth. It is our relationship with Christ which gives meaning to our lives. Roy Angel was a poor preacher with a millionaire brother. It was back in the oil boom days of the late 1940s, and Roy's older brother happened to own the right piece of Texas prairie at the right time. When he sold it, he became a multi-millionaire overnight. One year, a week before Christmas, the wealthy man visited his preacher brother in Chicago and presented him with a new car, 
a gleaming top of the line Packard. Roy decided to keep the new car down the street in a parking garage where it would remain under the careful eye of an attendant. One morning, he was surprised when he came to get his Packard. There, with his face pressed up against one of the car windows, was a young, ragamuffin, ghetto boy. The little boy wasn't doing anything really suspicious. He was obviously just peering into the new car's interior with wide, admiring eyes. Hello, son, Roy said. The boy looked around at him. Is this your car, mister? Yes, Roy replied, it is. How much did it cost? Well, I really don't know how much it cost. You mean you own this car and you don't know how much it cost? No, I don't. Because my brother gave it to me as a present. At this, the boy's eyes grow even wider. He thought about something for a moment and then said wistfully, I wish, I wish. Roy thought he knew how the boy would finish the sentence. He thought he was going to say, I wish I had a brother like that. But he didn't. The boy looked up at Roy and said, I wish, I wish I could be a brother like that. The minister, taken aback by his reply, asked, well, son, would you like to take a ride in it? The boy immediately answered, you bet. So they got in the car, exited the parking garage, and drove slowly down the street. The little boy ran his hand across the soft fabric of the front seat, inhaled the new car's smell, and touched the shiny metal of the dashboard. Then he looked at his new friend and asked, Mr. Would you, could you, Take me by my house. It's just a few blocks from here. Again, Roy assumed he knew what the lad wanted to do. He thought the boy probably wanted to show off the car he was riding into some of the neighborhood kids. Well, he thought, why not? So at his young passenger's direction, Roy pulled up in front of an old, run-down tenement building. Mister, the boy said as he stopped at the curb, would you stay here a minute? I'll be right back. Roy let the car idle as the boy rushed upstairs and disappeared. After about 10 minutes, the preacher began to wonder where the boy had gone. He got out of the car and peered into the darkened stairwell of the building. As he was looking up the stairs, he heard someone slowly coming down. The first thing he saw emerging from the gloom were two limp little legs. A moment later, Roy saw the little boy carrying a younger boy, evidently his brother. The boy gently set his brother down on the curb. See, he said with satisfaction, it's just as I told you, it's a brand new car. His brother gave it to him and someday I'm gonna buy you a car just The punch of this story is found in the one brother's generosity toward another. But it isn't the millionaire's gift that made the greater impact. We are moved by the heart of that little boy from the slums and his heartfelt yearning. I wish, I wish I could be a brother like that. Isn't that what Jesus is praying for us? Jesus wants us to be like him. Jesus wants us to be able to take what he teaches us out into the world. He wants us to have such a devotion to him that we will say, I wish, I wish I could be like Jesus. Remember his words as he prays to his father. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me so that they may be one as we are one. You see, it is when we are one with Jesus that we understand the true meaning of life. Jesus continues in his prayer, and you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. You see, Jesus sends us, his disciples, 
into the world to share his love and to serve his people. But he doesn't sound as ill-prepared. Jesus knows the importance of deepening our relationship with God so that we walk in God's truth. Sure, we may be challenged to define when life begins. Is it at conception, at birth, or when the last kid leaves and the dog dies? But Jesus takes the question one step further. It's not so much about when life begins as it is about how we live our lives. Jesus tells us that we are to live our lives for him. Sisters and brothers, our mission in this world is to share Jesus Christ with others. For when we do, we experience and we encounter the true meaning of life. Take the plunge. Be filled with the fullness of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and embrace your mission. Amen and amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this opportunity to remember that you call us to serve, that you equip us, and that we belong to you. We may be in the world, but not of the world. Help us to live into the challenge that you put before us. Help us to be instruments of your peace and guardians of your love. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. In honor 